uh, the period of the exile in Babylon. So as we're coming up to the, the area of, of Daniel. Uh, we've uh, looked at, at uh, the people we get to Judah alone and Nebuchadnezzar starts uh, making a mention here, Nebuchadnezzar, the time of the Babylonian exile. Uh, here we go. Uh, a cuneiform uh, tablet. Uh, sorry, a slightly grainy picture to enlarge it, uh, taken under rather dark conditions with my, from my uh, Kindle pad in the British Museum. Uh, the Babylonian Chronicles, uh, this tablet is one of a series of chronicles from Babylon that we have that summarize the sort of principal historical events from each year uh, from 747 BC to 280 BC. So we've got a lot of these Babylonian Chronicles. And in 605, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian crown prince, uh, replaces his father Nebopulsar as the commander in chief of the army, led an army out to the Euphrates defeats the Egyptians, and later that year, Nebuchadnezzar died, and Nebuchadnezzar returned to Babylon to be crowned as king. And then later on, marches back to Egypt, uh, doesn't do so well this time, marches out to Syria, and marching west again in uh, December 598, uh, as Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had ceased to pay tribute. Same old story, eh? So uh, Nebuchadnezzar armies uh, besieged Jerusalem and he eventually captures Jerusalem on the 16th of March 597 BC. And the new king of Judah, Jehoiachin, was captured and carried off to Babylon. Uh, and a series of expeditions to Syria finishes off this chronicle. But it's mentioning here particular biblical events and, and people uh, from the Bible. Here's a, a clay seal uh, again these are really useful because they, they put people's names to a date and a place this clay seal found in the ashes of a house that was burnt down when nebuchadnezzar conquered jerusalem in the sixth century and it bears the words belonging to nathan melech servant of the king this is quite a distinctive name and it's found in the old testament story of king josiah of judah uh, Josiah the reformer who removed the symbols of pagan worship from Jerusalem mentioned in 2 Kings 23 and of course it's not possible to be absolutely certain that the name on this seal refers to the same person who's mentioned in 2 Kings uh, but the description of Nathan Melech as an official or servant of the king is, is a match as is the location and the timing of this find so this is plausibly uh, the seal of this uh, servant who's mentioned in the Bible. Then we have the fall of Jerusalem and the, and the exile following the, the, the siege. Nebuchadnezzar installed uh, Zedekiah as a vassal king, but he also resulted and had to lay siege again. And th that's when he broke through uh, the walls and uh, just sort of took over the whole thing wholesale. Uh, Zedekiah was blinded and taken captive to Babylon, where he remained a, a prisoner until his death. And just last year, his uh, Shimon Gibson, uh, talking about uh, an archaeological dig, uh, results uh, from 2019, uh, where the combination of an ashy layer full of artifacts mixed with arrowheads and a very special ornament. We see at the top here an arrowhead, at the bottom an ornament. I think this is sort of uh, a cluster of sort of grapes under a uh, part of an earring, I think, uh, indicates some kind of devastation and destruction. Uh, nobody abandons gold and jewel jewelry, and nobody has arrowheads in their domestic refuse. He says, the ha arrowheads are Scythian arrowheads, known to be used by the Babylonians, and together this evidence points to the historical conquest of the city of Babylon. And of course. Ezekiel um, supposedly completed about 575-65 BC. The book of Ezekiel contains a, a prophetic a prediction about the fate of the powerful seaport city state of Tyre after the Babylonian exile. Uh, you can read about this in Ezekiel 26. This prophecy, prophecy supposedly dates from 586 BC, which is the 11th year of the reign of King Jehoiakim. 
And there seem to be a number of specific predictions when you, you tease them out. That more than one nation will attack Tyre, uh, that the attacks will be successive, that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon will attack, that Nebuchadnezzar will first of all attack coastal towns, that Tyre will be levelled, that the rubble will be put into the sea, that Tyre will become a place where fishermen can dry their nets, and that the inhabitants will never rebuild Tyre. Now I put here a, a, a map of Tyre to show you that there was a, a plain with a, a city of, of, of Tyre and a, a little island just off the coast which had a fortress of Tyre on it as well, this whole sort of Tyre uh, region, city-state of Tyre. So what happened? Well, uh, from the extra bit of evidence, we know that about 25 years after this prophecy is supposedly made, Tyre was besieged for 13 years by Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar took the main city of Tyre in 573 BC, uh, at which point the island citadel surrendered uh, to him. But 250 years later, 250 years later, in 322 BC, Alexander the Great on his campaigns uh, had occasion to attack Tyre. He used the rubble from the old mainland city that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and slave labour from the surrounding nations to build a causeway out to the island fortress of Tyre to capture it because he, did, he didn't have a navy with him. Uh, to attain enough material for the causeway, the mainline site was scraped clean. And you can see the difference here between this uh, map uh, that we saw originally and this uh, 19th century map, where we now have a, a, a between what had been the mainland and the island, this is isthmus uh, had grown up around the causeway that uh, Alexander the Great had built from the one to the other. So that's the difference between Tyre, uh, a map from the, the 4th century BC, and one in the 19th century. It shows that the difference that this had made. Uh, here is uh, Ezekiel mentioned on our, our timeline there. Uh, so this is 250 years after the, the era of Ezekiel. We get Alexander the Great in about 322 BC. So um, after treating Tyre with the greatest atrocity, says uh, this historian, uh, Alexander rebuilt and replanted it. Uh, that future generations might regard him as the founder of a new city. Uh, that's uh, Shoshé Chandadut from the Historical Studies and Recreations. And although there is now a, a town of Tyre in the vicinity of the ancient city, it, it's got no connection with the, with the ancient city of Tyre, which is long since gone. And um, indeed, fishermen have used the, the spot of, the, of ancient Tyre for generations for the spreading of their as their nets. So um, that's just a little uh, a side point about what's also sort of being talked about at the time and its fulfillment over history. We come to the uh, Babylonian exile period and uh, we have Jeremiah on the map here. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied that the people of Judah would be captive in Babylonia for 70 years. And Jeremiah's message, according uh, to the book of Jeremiah, was recorded by a man named Barak, son of Neriah. Well, interestingly, among the schools of these, uh, schools of these inscribed uh, thumb-sized boule that have come to light in Jerusalem is one that reads, belonging to uh, Bariah, the son of Neriah, the scribe. Uh, the owner is uh, Barak, Barakiah, Barak being a shortened version of the same name, his father is Neriah. Uh, there's little doubt really that this seal impression was made by Jeremiah's uh, scribe. Uh, so here, here is the seal impression of the, the guy who, who physically wrote the book of Jeremiah as the scribe for the prophet Jeremiah. So here we have a picture of the extent of the, in orange here, the, the Babylonian uh, Empire, which uh, Israel is now in uh, exile and people taken from 
uh, Jerusalem to Babylon to serve as servants uh, for the state. Uh, and uh, particularly here mentioning about Daniel. Now, interestingly, Greek historians had described the building of Babylon to uh, Queen Samuramat, uh, a queen mother in Assyria, who we now know actually had nothing to do with the building of Babylon. But in the book of, Babel, uh, book of Daniel, uh, chapter 4, verse 30, it says, um, as the king uh, was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? So it's saying, the Bible here is saying Nebuchadnezzar uh, was the one who's really responsible for the building uh, of the, the, the greatness of Babylon, not uh, talking about Queen Same Rabat, uh, as the Greek historians did. Again, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was one of those figures whom we had no extra biblical evidence of and, and sort of uh, German 19th century uh, liberal scholars used to say was just a made up figure. Uh, but here we have, for example, um, uh, a stone uh, mentioning uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who cares for Isagel and Isa, eldest son of Nebo Pulsar, king of Babylon. Or the cylinder of Nebuchadnezzar II, uh, a clay cylinder, cuneiform text all over it, describes three palaces which Nebuchadnezzar built for himself in Babylon. And we've got other references to Nebuchadnezzar in connection with building works. Uh, here we have a little cuneiform thing that mentions a one Nebo Sarskin, chief eunuch of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, a, a visiting professor from uh, Vienna at the uh, British Museum, discovered this uh, in 2007. Uh, just sort of stumbled across it, uh, came across uh, Nabu Shashruka Ukin. Everything gets uh, the names are described slightly differently in different languages, and, and there wasn't uh, uniform spelling and things at the time, of course. Um, described uh, as the chief eunuch of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Uh, so uh, Professor Gioso, who's an Assyriologist, uh, checked his Old Testament and in chapter 39 of the book of Jeremiah, he found, albeit spelled slightly differently, the same name, Nebo Saskin, and this tablet dated to the 10th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II, uh, 12 years before the siege of Jerusalem said, uh, finding something like this tablet where we see a person mentioned in the Bible making an everyday payment to the temple in Babylon and quoting the exact date is quite extraordinary. Uh, King Jehoiachin uh, was uh, taken uh, to uh, Babylon, uh, taken prisoner, and uh, when one evil Merodach uh, evil not being used in the way that we in English use the word evil, of course. Uh, evil Merodach became king of Babylon. He took uh, pity on Jehoiachin and released him from prison. And the biblical text actually mentions that the Babylonian king spoke kindly to Jehoiachin and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the, the kings who were with him in Babylon. And uh, says that the evil Merodach uh, gave Jehoiachin a set of uh, provisions uh, daily provisions. Uh, as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life, uh, in 2 Kings 25. Well, here we actually have in cuneiform the Babylonian document that lists the provisions that are to be given to uh, King Jehoiakim uh, from the administrative documents. Jehoiakim's name is clearly legible on the tablets. Uh, and there's a documentation, a documentation for an allotment of grain and oil and various foodstuffs that he is to be provided, uh, he, him and his uh, retinue. Uh, fascinating time. Just, just this little aside comment in Two Kings about these rations. And here we have the extra biblical list of the rations that are being provided. Uh, this is a seal of Eliakim, steward of Jehoiakim, who's mentioned in 2 Kings 19.2, uh, discovered by uh, William F. Albright in the 1920s. It says, it says on it, the property of Eliakim, steward of Jehoiakim. 
Now, you know the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, of course, and we, it's you know, difficult to get direct evidence of uh, the, the really spectacular uh, events of this story. Um, but we do know some of the background. We know that burning as a penalty for crime appears twice in the Code of Hammurabi, um, set forth by the Babylonian king in the 18th century BC. Uh, we know that uh, another early Babylonian monarch called Rimsin also used burning uh, as a form of execution. So it's not too surprising um, when Shadok, Meshach and Abednego are sentenced to a, a burning execution. Uh, also, I, uh, there's this report that there's a, a clay prism that's been found in Babylon, that's now meant to be in the Istanbul Museum, uh, that lists uh, names that are very similar to the names of Daniel's three friends, uh, although we can't be certain that they're the actual men mentioned in the Bible. Um, but there are, uh, so there's uh, Ardi Nabu, official to the royal prince, this name is the equivalent of the Aramaic name Abegnigo, Ari Nabu, Abegnigo, and may, may in fact be the first mention of one of Daniel's friends from outside the Bible. Another found on this list is Hananu, commander of the king's merchants, and the name Hananu may be the Babylonian equivalent of the Hebrew name Hananiah, Hanana, na na na, you know. Uh, and another name found on the list is uh, Michelin Marduk, the Babylonian name with the Babylonian god Marduk uh, as an official of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, uh, if Marduk is left out of the name we wind up with Meshalim which may refer to Mishael. It may be a form of Mishael, Mishak, Mishael uh, and they've just added Marduk to sort of Babylonianize the name. Uh, and the fact that these three names, not only that these three names are similar to the these three names in the story but that the three names are found on the, you know, the list as officials, which Daniel and his friends were taken to Babylon to be trained as to, to serve as servants as officials in the Babylonian court um, is suggestive, but of course not conclusive. Now you know the story of Daniel in the lion's den, of course, uh, and here we have a uh, uh, relief of the British Museum of lion hunting and uh, lions in their, their lion den here. In ancient Assyria, lion hunting was considered the sport of kings. Uh, today in, uh, in uh, the UK, the royal family tend to play uh, pol polo uh, from horseback, you know, uh, but back then it was uh, lion hunting, uh, symbolic of the ruling monarch's duty to protect and fight for the people, so they say. Well, here we have a sculpted relief from the British Museum that illustrates the sporting exploits of the last great Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, from the 7th century BC, uh, which were created for his palace at Nineveh in modern day northern Iraq. So um, the culture at that time, the sort of uh, the previous uh, regime, the Assyrian before the Babylonian Empire, kings had uh, been the sport of kings to, to hunt lions. Here's a, a close-up uh, of a, a king uh, skewering uh, this rather fearsome looking uh, lion. He looks very calm, calm about it, doesn't he? Huh. Uh, so the fact that uh, Nebuchadnezzar would have had um, a lion den uh, to hand uh, is perhaps not all that culturally surprising. If you've ever thought, you know, how come he throws in to a lion den are these like wild lions that they have to kind of go out into the countryside and find some sort of lion den to throw them in or it's quite plausible that actually this was like the the royal hunting estate uh, as it were and they kept lions to be hunted uh, and that they threw Daniel into this uh, lion's den. Uh, so then uh, <coughs> right at the end of the the exile we have the famous incident of Belshazzar, Belshazzar's feast. Uh, was Belshazzar really king of Babylon, as Daniel 5 claims? Some scholars have said that in fact he wasn't king and 
uh, use this as evidence that the Book of Daniel is not historically reliable. So uh, Babylonian texts tell us that at the time of uh, the feast story uh, in the Bible, in Daniel, in 539 BC, uh, there was another king, uh, Nabidonis, who was Belshazzar's father. So wouldn't that make Belshazzar the crown prince at the time rather than king? Well, uh, a chap called George Heath White, who was then a, a first uh, final year student uh, in Cambridge University, uh, a student of Assyrian, uh, made an interesting discovery whilst translating some 6th century BC Babylonian tablets for his dissertation. Uh, George was following the lives of some Judean exiles in Babylon and came across a character who was given the adopted name of Belshazzar, which means Lord uh, Bel, the god Bel, uh, protect the king. Uh, this uh, Babylonian name adoption was a custom for those who worked in the government, uh, as we know from, from Daniel's case, we're talking about adding uh, uh, God's names to people's names to sort of Babylonianize them and so on. So uh, this Judean uh, Belshazzar uh, appears in three texts, and in the first two, he's Belshazzar. But in the third text, he's changed, the same guy has changed his name back to one that reflects his Hebrew origins. And Heath White wondered what might have made him want to stop being called Belshazzar. Well, research has also shown that in Babylonian times, you weren't allowed to have the same name as the king. So if you were called Belshazzar, and someone who was also called Belshazzar became king, it was time for you to change your name. And George points out that this Judean government worker may have changed his name for other reasons, but it is pretty plausible that he did so because Nabonidus's son, Belshazzar, really had become king. That would explain everything. But wasn't Nabonidus himself still king? Well, actually, another text uh, translated by a chap called Gibson records that in the year 552 BC, Nabidonus had relocated to the Arabian desert and made his son co-regent, ruling in Babylon. Now this also explains why Belshazzar offers Daniel the title of third highest in the kingdom. Look at Daniel 5.16. Um, so third highest in the kingdom after Nabidonus and Belshazzar. Uh, fascinatingly, this year 552 was the very same year the Judean civil servant changed his name so that he wouldn't be called Belshazzar anymore. This year that we have the record of Nabodonus relocating to the Arabian desert and making his son co-king, co-regent. So that all ties up together. Uh, for this research, George received a, a university award uh, it's circumstantial evidence, but as he puts it, uh, perhaps if correct, a little bit more evidence to counter the popular opinion that Belshazzar being called king in Daniel 5.1 is an error. Uh, he was king, he was a co-regent, he was king even though he was officially second in command, and that's why he can only make Daniel third in command uh, in Daniel uh, 5.16. So Daniel 5.29, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain placed around his neck and was proclaimed third highest ruler in the kingdom. So here we have a, a, another cuneiform cylinder, cylinder of Nabodonus, in which King Nabodonus mentions his co-regent uh, and it mentions Belshazzar, my firstborn son, the offspring of my heart. And cuneiform temple receipts from Sippar uh, also show Belshazzar presenting animals as an offering of the king. Uh, so we've got various bits of data from Babylonian sources that all actually tie in and make sense of what's going on in the, in the Daniel story here. And then uh, Babylon falls to King Cyrus of Persia. And here we have 
a little uh, inscription on one of these little uh, barrels <laughs> uh, of inscriptions uh, from King Cyrus, a little bit of propaganda talking about, uh, I entered Babylon as a friend and established my royal residence in the palace of the princes amid jubilation and rejoicing. You know, everyone was so happy that I'd conquered them. My numerous troops walked around Babylon in peace because there was numerous troops. I also restored to the cities on the other side of the Tigris, like the foreigners, their hitherto long ruined temples. I also gathered up their one-time inhabitants and returned them to their homelands. So he, by the new, the new power, made himself popular by sending home the people who'd been taken into exile, sending them home, saying, you can rebuild your temples and stuff so long as you all still sort of nominally pay tribute to me and you're sort of under my rulership. Uh, and of course, this was the end of the exile, uh, as we've seen, as had been uh, prophesied by Jeremiah. Uh, 